you know, saving a life, you know, I've done it with my bare hands. You, you can save thousands of lives by implementing policy that works for the people, especially in regards to poverty and to uh, the houseless issues in, in Canada and, and around the world, right? We can learn and we can do better. Hey, fellow workers, my name is Kim Seaver, and you are tuning in to another episode of the Alberta Worker Podcast. We are a proud member of the Labor Radio Network, as well as new of this season, a Harbinger Media Network. We are broadcasting from the territory of the Nitsitsapi. This is episode seven of season two. And I am pleased to welcome our guest today, Jordan Wilkie, the leader of the Green Party of Alberta and a firefighter in the Edmonton area. Welcome, Jordan. Hey, Kim. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. You betcha. So yeah, we're just going to get right into it. And we'll just have you tell us your life story, you know, where you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school, that sort of thing. And then as well, tell us your personal labor history, your first job, subsequent jobs, you know, what you're doing now and what led you to, to that part of your labor journey. And you can either tell those separately or you can just intermingle them, but the floor is all yours. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So coming from Edmonton, a Treaty 6, Métis Region 4, and uh, yeah, big fan of everything you do, Kim, and the research research that you do. And, and uh, again, it's uh, an honor to be here. So uh, my history is, uh, you know, grew up in, in Alberta. Uh, my family kind of traveled around a little bit. At some point we were in Ontario. And as far as my family history is concerned, we come from farmers, uh, teachers. Uh, my grandfather was the principal of Skona High School. Uh, my father played for the Oilers. Uh, he ended up becoming a lawyer. Obviously, hockey was a little different back then and not quite as lucrative. And uh, He went back to school, went to UBC uh, and became a lawyer. So my mother, uh, she worked with English as a second language, uh, another teacher. She went into therapy and, and psychology. And, you know, I'm very proud of my family. We have a you know a history of giving back. My great grandfather uh, was actually uh, a soldier in World War One. Uh, he was gassed in the trenches, and, and he didn't live long after that, although he did return from the war. Both my grandparents flew in the war. Really proud of the sacrifices that they all made and been in, you know, a lot to live up to. Uh, my grandfather is a pioneer in, in aviation uh, in Canada. His name is Max Ward, and he uh, was a bush pilot up in the north from, you know, a single airplane going through the harshest conditions. Uh, he grew uh, a, a, an incredible company that, you know, everyone was very proud to to work for, and, and um, there's a lot of uh, honor around uh, the service that he gave and how he treated people. And so again, a lot to live up to in my family, but a lot of service and a lot of focusing on doing the right thing and helping out people. For me, I always wanted to be, you know, helpful, a hero, you could say, as a kid, you know, growing up. And my first word was actually truck because I had a fire truck. And so I was that... Uh, pinnacle kid that grew up with fire trucks, wanted to be a firefighter, and then followed my dream to become a firefighter. So that was a, an exciting, you know, roundabout journey. And it took, again, a lot of sacrifice and a lot of dedication. Uh, I was turned down and I was told all my life, you know, you're too small to be a firefighter or, you know, it's too difficult and stop trying. But I think that a lot of that really forged that mentality of breaking through to, to ensure that, you know, your dreams matter and that you can work hard and get to where you need to be. Right. But I've also had a lot of uh, support and, and, and a working family. So I'm very privileged in that regard to have uh, the support to follow my dreams. Um, but at the end of the day, we know that compassion and giving back and working hard and doing the right thing, you get paid back in such a, a level that, you know, the business world can't compete with. And so I think it's really exciting for those that, you know, work hard in their jobs and follow their dreams. It's exciting to, to see those journeys unfold. And I've had quite the journey to get to where I am now. Yeah, I've been a firefighter for 15 years, local 209 for the International Association of Firefighters. And I'm uh, very proud of the teams that I've worked with and the crews and then the sacrifices that we've made to help other people. And I wish that we're not always showing up on people's worst days, you know, but it's it's definitely an honor to be in that position. And, and uh, I've never taken it for granted once. I mean, it's been a long winding journey to, to get to where I am, but I've loved my job and I've been doing it for the last 15 years. Speaking of like first jobs, uh, I know you asked that. I, following sort of the family heritage, I was up in Yellowknife uh, working with float planes, uh, docking float planes and, and working in the aviation industry up there. It was uh, kind of a lot different back then and, and not as regulated. It, it's still pretty pretty cool up in, in, in Yellowknife and up in the north, but you know, I think things have changed a lot. So how old were you? I started when I was about 15 working up there in the summers. Yeah. You know, experiencing just a total 
you know, different world up there where, you know, at some point there is no night. You know, once you get up into the further north, you kind of get that connection to the land totally differently. Everything is no longer in a grid system and you see what it, what it's really like, you know, being a kid that's grown up in cities. Uh, it was definitely a, a huge eye opener for me. Totally. And I imagine that probably affected your outlook on life and society and whatnot. It did. It made me question, you know, because if you're not pulled out of the, uh, the, you know, sort of the, like I call it the grid system, when you come back from the wild, you look at the trees that are all in a row and everything's manicured and you just shake your head uh, and you wonder why we're doing all of this when we lose touch with the natural world and with the environment that sustains us uh, then you know bad things happen obviously that's been very influential for me and and moving towards the green party yeah it's just been such a a, a crazy journey to be up you know in the middle of nowhere and then to come back and try to reestablish yourself back into society sometimes as a young kid uh, it was kind of a, a bit of a shock to the system uh, but i appreciated you know all the time up there uh, working and you know as soon as i could i was doing co-ops with the fire and getting that career yeah i just worked my tail off and did a lot of work in, in hospitals, doing uh, some volunteer, uh, some low paid uh, jobs where I would, you know, move patients around hospitals and just to get into the system. And I went out to BC and, and became a, an EMT out there and, you know, went through the ambulance system and I ended up getting hired in Edmonton. If I uh, hadn't got hired in Edmonton, I was actually going up to uh, back up to Yellowknife to be a firefighter there for a while. Oh, wow. It was always my focus and it was kind of like... I, you just keep going until you, you can't do it anymore. Right. Whatever you can. I, I did serving jobs. I worked in a fish and chip shop, all those, all those. Nice. <laughs> While I was uh, studying and, and just, you know, working out and, and making sure that I was at my best for this position because it's, it's a hell of a job and it's, it's been an exciting career. Sure. And where did you go to school? I went to school out in Ontario after my family moved from Alberta. And then I went to Western University. I took philosophy there. Uh, that was part of, you know, the questioning of, of society that I talked to you about earlier that sure. I think stemmed from being up north and why are we doing this and what's it all for? And then after that, once I was hired as a firefighter, uh, I ended up going to Royal Roads and I did my disaster management course out there. So I did a master's understanding that there's bigger issues that, that are at our doorstep now between climate and population issues and supply chain issues. We all have a role to play in, in how to adapt to that. It's you know definitely uh, something that will become you know more and more of a prominent issue is disasters, emergencies, and how we can manage those in the best way possible because if we don't have policies in place that are proactive uh, within the you know political realm and this is why I got into politics then we will always be reactive politically and uh, in the sense of emergency when you're only reactive you're waiting for almost worst case scenarios to happen as you've seen in the wildfires this year's worst case scenarios that are happening or, or the poverty issues or the poison drug uh, epidemic you know we have to get in front of them or lives are at stake properties at stake but you know more importantly you know, people are dying and, and if you wait for that to happen and then react to it, you've already lost uh, people that could have been saved if we had acted more proactively. The issues that are, you know, at our doorstep, you know, if we have the the ability to to step up and create proactive policy and to get in front of them, we can save thousands of lives. And that's, you know, saving a life, you know, I've done it with my bare hands. You, you can save thousands of lives by implementing policy that works for the people, especially in regards to poverty and to uh, the houseless issues in, in Canada and, and around the world, right? We can learn and we can do better. Yeah, totally. And of course, when you react to things instead of try to prepare and anticipate things, it ends up being more expensive in the long run as well, because the solutions 100%. are going to be w way more expensive rather than trying to plan for things and prepare for things, which, you know, you could spread the, the cost over a longer period rather than having to do everything immediately. In the disaster management world, we call it focusing events. Here's a perfect example is, you know, they were saying, okay, Vancouver, you know, is going to get hit by an earthquake at some point. We need a search and rescue team. We need a search and rescue team, like a, a heavy, it's called USAR, uh, uh, urban search and rescue, which, which is like a massive expense with lots of uh, heavy machinery and lots of training, but they couldn't get it. They said, oh, it's too expensive. And then uh, the San Francisco earthquake happened. And after that, they started talking about it. So it's like, these things have to happen. And then they talked about it. I think it was like five to seven years later, they got it. And I'm not sure about that timeline, but it was something ridiculous like that, where it's like, why do we always have to wait for a focusing event when we have, you know, the science and we have the understanding, uh, especially around, you know, issues like climate, where 
we know that water is going to become a massive, massive issue. And we know that the grid will be destabilized for many reasons. And yet we don't protect people in ways that are so elementary in regards to whether it's fire, floods, you name it. It's at our doorstep. The heat waves are going to be such a shock. We always just wait for that event. And then we create a reactionary measure and it goes through, you know, as a bill and things get passed or we get new standard operating procedures in the fire department. But it's like, why does someone always have to die when we know so much about what's coming for us? And so that's always been a problem for me as a worker as well, right? Uh, you know, taking it back to labor, it's like, you can see that these things are dangerous. You can, you know, let's go to, you know, cancer rates and in, in firefighting is freaking massive. Firefighting has become a class one carcinogen in and of itself. And yet they fight tooth and nail, the unions and through creating partnerships and uh, you know, going to meeting after meeting, they, they, they fight tooth and nail for coverage uh, for cancers. And slowly and surely you get these presumptive coverages for you know, these different types of cancers that are affecting your throat or something like that. And they say, okay, if you've worked this long, you know, it's like, it's a class one carcinogen. If there's a cancer, we know that it's, it's probably job related. And we know that these things are interactive. It doesn't matter what your lifestyle is. If you've got a cancer and you've been in the fire service, you, sh you should probably get covered for that cancer. So it's just, again, it's this constant reactive measure uh, within the labor just to protect people that are going into burning buildings to save people and property. It's wild that we have to fight for every dollar. It's trivial too, because of the differences in technology that uh, we're faced with now with, you know, for example, lithium batteries in cars. Who's to say you walk by a plume of lithium smoke and it's your first day on the job, cancer develops and it's like, oh no, you weren't on the, the job long enough. You can't put a timeline on these things. This isn't wood that's burning anymore. It's, it's the most harsh and horrible uh, plastics and chemicals that are burning in these fires. Um, and so it's just wild to see that we still have to fight through our unions and through um, constant effort to get recognized for these issues that uh, affect, you know, one in four firefighters. It's just wild. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely frustrating, but you can extrapolate that into the wider world of all the issues in society. And we can ask ourselves, what are we waiting for when we know so much about why these issues exist and, and all the proactive ways that we can overcome them? So it's frustrating. I'm definitely frustrated. Yeah, no, I could tell. I don't know if you knew this, but my grandpa was a firefighter. Okay. He he retired a couple of decades ago, but he dealt with breathing problems for you know, the last few years of his life. I don't think he died of cancer, but he certainly had a lot of breathing problems. He was on oxygen and stuff and yeah, ended up having to go into care home because he couldn't properly take care of himself and, and that sort of thing. You know, I see similar issues, coal miners having to deal with black lung and fighting their employers to, you know, receive yes. health coverage and stuff because they're going into these positions and the employers know full well, especially now knowing full well that there are going to be health issues. Same with like professional athletes, especially uh, high contact yeah. sports, like, you know, NFL. And the CFL, right? right? Um, concussions. There've been a couple of movies made on that and stuff where they are having to deal with concussions. And, you know, the employer always knows that there are health risks and they aren't willing to be able to mitigate those risks and the effects of those risks on the workers. And it doesn't matter if it's firefighters or coal miners or, you know, million dollar making football players. It's always the same story. And it's just ridiculous. Like employers are always trying to do as little as possible in order to maximize the amount of profit they, that they make. It's always incremental too. Sure. What the hell is that, right? So I can't remember what the, the co cancer coverage is in Alberta, but they, you know, so now the politicians are all celebrating that it's the highest out of all the other provinces by one. They're at 20 now or something like that. And it's like, we're going to do this. We're going to make this, first of all, a political scoreboard. And then second of all, like you're going to have to fight for each and every one of these things. And here's the thing. Uh, mental health has come a long way, as we know. It's come a long way. And within firefighting, uh, it's also come a long way. And so for PTSD, which is something that I've suffered from, I talk about it openly because it's an exposure issue within fire, similar to cancer. You can only see so much before it starts affecting you. It starts affecting how you relate to your family and, and your children. You know, in my Mine was specifically around infant deaths and 
and children. That affects a ton of firefighters and paramedics and police officers, you name it. And it's one of the reasons why we only had one child is I couldn't get my head around having another child and dealing with the anxiety that I have around infants and being hurt and things like that. You know, I went and did therapy, but this is the interesting part is when I reached out for help and said, I can't, I need help. They were amazing. And I know a lot of people have a lot of bad dealings with WCB and some people have really good, smooth dealings with WCB. But first of all, the fire service has come a long way in recognizing it and creating the language and there's a peer support group. They take you to WCB. WCB says you are basically innocent till proven otherwise. Like you're a first responder, you have mental health, you've reached out for help. Here you go. You start getting help right away. I got directed to a therapist. Uh, we started the process. The therapist was like, yes, 100%. This is PTSD. So that's how it should be for cancer, right? Why are we doing this incrementally when we have you know, the processes in place for other things like, you know, mental health, where it's like you're absolutely innocent till proven otherwise, like not even innocent, but like, yes, like if it's cancer, it should be exactly the same way. If you're diagnosed with cancer, they should say this is absolutely part of, you know, being a firefighter, considering the statistics around this, the science around this and the nature of your job and the nature of the chemicals that are now introduced into uh, the world that you're within, uh, that you're breathing in and that you're exposed to. Totally. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy that we have to do this, Kim, constantly, whether it's coal mining, whether it's a, a raise in pay. You know, it, it's just mental that like, the games that they play uh, to incrementalize the whole scenario of workers' rights, uh, you know, the, the wages, uh, the coverage, everything has to be tooth and nail. And that's why the, the unions are so important. And that's why, you know, having politicians on the side of labor is so freaking critical. You know, I know you've said, where's the labor party, real labor party in Alberta? And I know that a lot of Greens go, oh, we're the labor party. But it's like, yeah, prove it to me. <laughs> And we are doing that, which is so critical. And and you saw even on Vote Compass, right? It was like, here we are way over on the left. Sure, yeah. And it's like, just in, in no man's land, Alberta, you know? And the Alberta line of what is left and right is also so skewed uh, that, you know, we're maybe just center left yet in Alberta. <laughs> it's like off in the distance. <laughs> You know, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, labor is about issues that factor into the majority, that protects the workers, that protects wage earners. That's what it's all about. And, it, you know, I think that we can really get behind, you know, a movement in that regard because the NDP has left, you know, that position so far. They've gone so far from it. I was just reading uh, about the lobbyists within the, the NDP that are shilling for oil and gas, working with corporations from Airbnb to Uber to tell us, you know, Husky Oil. It's just like you, you read these things and you're like, there's just no one for the worker. And, you know, when we talk about oil and gas and when we talk about, you know, the issues around transitions and just or fair transitions, it's like they're not even talking about pensions. How do you protect pensions? How do you protect the seniority levels and the identity of this worker? They're just like, oh yeah, I know you'll find a pink job or a green job and you know, like you'll, you'll be good. It's just a, a wild to think that people will go for that when you're not even having the fair discussions, dealing with the incre incrementalism and dealing with the fact that there's so many jobs. And this is the linchpin of our, our entire platform that we had was you go after the royalty rates, you bring up L Lougheed's levels of royalty rates. And Lougheed did some incredible things. He created crown corporations. He created a, a you know crown corporation regarding oil and gas, you know, nationalized. You know, these things are just insane to even talk about in this day and age. And yet politicians won't go anywhere near it. But the royalty rates pay for themselves. And the polluter pay system, as I said, many, many times pays workers specifically to clean up. The reclamation jobs are the key to any transition in Alberta. It's worker centric. It protects their seniority. It protects their pensions and their identity. You know, so it's exciting to be a worker, to be a wage earner, to be a, in a union and understand how we're getting taken for a ride. People used to scream to separate church and state and it's corporations and state right now. Oh, yeah. It's so mingled on so many levels. You got two wings of the same bird calling each other out. It's wild. Coming from where I'm at with watching the incrementalism that we're talking about, with, with understanding that no one's actually standing up for the, for the unions and for the labor rights. It's not even just unions. It's, you know, it's just working class people and 
and their need to put food on the table and an affordability crisis and what that the measures that need to be in place. What do you what do you do, Kim? Do you is it a general strike? What are we calling for today on on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, I think you're hitting the nail on the head when you're talking about incrementalism because part of the problem is that like everything's so partisan now. There's so much partisanship and mm -hmm. as a result, people are afraid to hold their party to account. And it, it doesn't matter which one, whether it's the NDP yes. or the UCP. The supporters are afraid to hold their party to the count. They're more than willing to criticize the other party, the party that they don't support, but they don't want to hold their other own party to account. And as a result, we get that incrementalism because when mm -hmm. your party's in charge, you aren't pressuring them to bring in the real change and, and support for the working class that has to be there. And by the time they're out of power, then it's too late because you know the other party's not going to do it. And so I think that's really a big part of it is just this partisanship and it's gotten worse. And I think as far as the NDP goes, your comments earlier about how they're not a Labour Party is I, I honestly think the old PC party moved to the right and took the place of where the wild rose. And then there was a vacuum that the NDP shifted over and took the place of the old PC party. And so really the NDP is only the PC party with a new logo and the UCP party is the Walrose party with a, a new logo. Exactly. Fundamentally, I, I don't think much has changed on the political landscape in Alberta. Right. Other than the names of the party. The, yeah. The 40-year dynasty is still there, I guess. Yeah. Well, they hollowed out whatever working class, you know, activists or, or leaders or organizations that were, you know, on both NDP, on both levels, both provincially and federally. And fe and federally, you see it because they, they embrace neoliberalism to displace the liberals for power. And you saw that this started with Jack Layton. Uh, and here, I mean, they've gone way past that now, as you said, as being basically becoming the progressive conservatives and trying to emulate themselves as this new Peter Lougheed style party, yet they're not for royalty rates and they're not for regulating the AER and they're not, and they are for oil and gas on so many levels, shilling for the corporations, not for the workers, although they love to talk about that. It's not about the workers. If we're talking about benefiting the workers, that's an easy game to play because you you create jobs and and our energy critic Reagan Boychuk uh, that you you know of uh, well I think uh, he painstakingly created the research uh, along with the Alberta Disclosure Liabilities Project to uh, show how many jobs in cleanup in reclamation uh, it tens of thousands over a 25 year period GDP growth at the level of working class families that they're not even talking about. The NDP won't even go there because the corporation said, no, thank you. And the lobbyists that are within the NDP are saying, oh, sorry, that's our other job. You know, it's wild. Uh, so there's this gap here, you know, and, and everyone's asking, when's Kim, you know, jumping in to politics? Are they really? Yeah, yeah. Everyone's asking. Kim, <laughs> <laughs> when's he running? When's he starting the Labour Party? <laughs> that's the discussion that needs to happen because the, that gap is there maybe it's green labor maybe we should be talking about that the transition is worker benefiting if not we're going to be caught in such a you know again reactive misery uh, i call it the the carousel of misery uh you know regarding poverty homelessness and addictions and crime it goes around and around and around. And going back to my uh, profession as a firefighter, you know, uh, when I'm not shaking my fist in, uh, on CTV or whatever, uh, as, as, as the green leader is, you know, how much pain and suffering are we going to allow and how much greed in our society uh, at the top until either a general strike breaks out or, you know, a full, something full on needs to happen? Because this incrementalism, you know, BS, whether it's wages, whether it's coverage, whether it's the issues within our society or the reaction to climate issues, it's going to end in this continuous, it's not even going to end. It's just going to be that continuous carousel of misery that causes the mental health issues that we have, the health issues that we have, the you know poor eating habits that creates even more of a burden on our system. And then, of course, you can see in Alberta the way that the system is moving away from, uh, you know, helping uh, the public, away from universal health care. Uh, you know, there's that clinic that just opened up in Calgary or, or that is now, you know, actively taking wages. And they've done that, you know, in some regard for years, but it's getting worse and worse. At some point, we have to say enough is enough, you know, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, Kim, like, what, what do you do? Because you say too much partisanship, 
right? Then what if it's not partisanship? Is it is it a, a, a general strike of workers? Is it uh, you know what what would actually make change take a leap instead of become uh, again this incremental ball game? Yeah, honestly. Like it has to come down to class solidarity because as long as we continue fighting amongst ourselves, nothing's going to change. We have to find a way to be able to bring people together from all walks of life, all spots on the political spectrum and realize, you know, we all have a vested interest in making sure that working class finds success and prosperity because it benefits everybody. I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but I think that's going to be the key is finding class solidarity. And I don't know that it's going to come from the party structures because like going back to transition and the transition's already underway. Like in the last nine years, Alberta has lost almost 50,000 jobs in the oil and gas sector. And so the transition's already happening. It's just a matter of whether we're going to take care of those workers or not. I don't know where those workers are gone. I just know what the numbers show. The numbers show that there are almost 50,000 fewer people working in the oil and gas sector than there were in July 2014. But I don't know where those workers are. I don't know if those workers are still in Alberta. I don't know if those workers are unemployed. I don't know where those if those workers are working in a different industry. If they have a completely different job, are they, are they flipping burgers? Are they doctors now? I, I don't know what they're doing. I just know that there aren't as many. And so the transition's already happening. And we just have to make sure that we're taking care of it. And I don't think any of the parties, well, the NDP and the UCP, at least provincially, are interested mm. in making sure that happens because none of them seem to be seriously interested in trying to take care of, of the workers. Some of the other issues you were talking about, like homelessness and drug addiction, it all comes down to not taking care of the working class. Yeah, absolutely. Like a lot of the underlying issues of those, like poverty, right? If we could address poverty, a lot of that would go away. Absolutely. And nobody seems to be interested in actually dealing with poverty. Nobody's interested in trying to encourage higher wages for workers, for example. That would be probably the single most important thing any political party could do is to try and encourage higher wages for workers. And not just higher minimum wage, although that would be nice because we haven't had an increase in like six years. But instead, they come up and say, oh, we'll just give everybody you know, lower taxes or whatever. Right. That doesn't help. Right in any meaningful way, not like higher wages would. Right. But how do you do that? Right. You have to enforce profit cap. Yeah. Because how much is enough? Or like a UBI. Yes. You're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> we could do two hours of UBI talk. <laughs> yeah, UBI is critical. I mean, my my wife, uh, she, she started a restaurant in Edmonton. And when the NDP raised the wages, it was great for the servers for a little bit. But then she had to cut down on... Uh, how much staff she could have because she was going to go out of business like immediately. Uh, so we kept kind of, again, trying to focus on how to keep this thing alive, you know, and then there was other things that were worker centric, which was great for them. But then now we're, we're only able to keep less people on staff. At some point, the business had to close down just because we're not a multi, you know, corporation. We're not Joey's or Earl's and their century grill or whatever it is, right? Like you have to have multiple, multiple businesses to really thrive in, in the restaurant industry. And so again, support your local restaurants and, and get out there. And But regardless, you know, UBI would have done the, it would have done the best thing ever because those people would be working there and they would be getting a universal basic income and that would create you know that that trickle up effect where you know more people are coming out to support the local restaurants uh wouldn't have been on her to, to make things you know basically her standards had to go down to to so to stay in business and that was the beginning of the end right you know universal basic income does the opposite opposite for employers i mean is like you're creating the best thing ever so that you can keep workers you know coming in and you're taking care of them you're giving them meaning which she was doing already and that's why people stuck around it's just such a game changer and of course when it comes down to poverty it's just such a no brainer on so many levels we don't need to go into this but like what i find too is you know you take something like a universal basic income income and like kim like you've been watching this on twitter and everything like that is like people talk about that like it's an evil thing as well like okay now the government's going to give you something and then they can claw it back and now they've got control over you and it's like you watch how the poison of this narrative comes in and it's fear-based where ubi on so many levels helps people gives such a leap forward of, of health and well-being in communities it, like we could talk about the benefits forever 
yet there's this poison that trickle in and it's good people that want the same thing as us. You know, they want to see people thrive and they want families to thrive and people to be healthy, but then they're like, no, they'll use it as a means to control us. Right. And it was the same thing with like, remember like, you know, like all the whole 15 minutes city thing. Yeah. I'm like, this is bonkers. It's like 15 minutes. These have been around for ages and it's like, it's about sustainability and, a- and access to things around you. It's no different than the hundred, remember the hundred mile diet, like eat locally, you know, it's, it's right. healthier and it gets poisoned than the people fight. And that's what you're saying is how do we come together? Uh, solidarity you know, and it's working class people fighting working class people. And it's like, they do you drop the fear poison into the pool and all of a sudden now people will not stand up and demand, you know, UBI or I'm not going to work. You know, because we know how much money is being robbed from us. If you look at the oil and gas industry, if you look at our royalty rates in Alberta specifically, we are getting robbed left, right, and center. And then they offer us the scraps. We have the power. We have to ensure that we stand up for ourselves. But when you poison the well, right, it creates this good people fighting one another. And you see it on social media. And that, this is nothing new. This conversation is nothing new, right? It's just devastating to watch uh, politically and, and you know, as, as a social movement. Is there ways to, to overcome partisanship? Is there ways to overcome the fear of, you know, some conspiracy theories and, and some ways of controlling the narrative so that we cannot stand together? The point you were making about, you know, fighting for scraps, I think that's so true that, you know, we're arguing about whether so-and-so has more scraps than I do, not yes. arguing about the fact that we only have scraps. Yes. We're, yes. we're blaming everybody else for our problems when it's not our fellow workers who are the issue. No. Like, they're in the same boat we are. They're being taken advantage just the same as anybody else's. And this is something I've been trying to do the last, I don't know, two or three years is really change the rhetoric I'm using. I've been trying to get away from this whole, you know, people on the right do this or people on the left do this. Yeah. Conservatives oh, yeah. do that and liberals do that. And I'm trying to get away from that and focus more on the separation between the working class and the capitalist class or the owning class. And just trying to have more of a class consciousness in the, in the rhetoric I'm using just to try and help people realize, you know, we're all in this together. And that's another thing too, is occasionally I'll have somebody comment on something I've posted. Well, specifically on Twitter, I know for sure that they are diehard conservatives, but they'll say something that at its foundation makes a lot of sense and maybe could be interpreted as anti-capitalist. And so I'll retweet it, you know, because I think stuff like that is worth boosting. And I just think that's part of it is just education, you know, just changing the way that we talk about issues and talking about yeah. how things are affecting us. But it's it's hard because people really buy into the messaging and that messaging has been decades in the making. Like since the the 60s and 70s, you know, the capitalist class has been crafting a message to convince us that the things that they are doing are for our benefit, that they will trickle down, for example. Right, yeah, the lazy poor. The yeah. lazy poor, right? right. Uh, why exactly. we cannot have UBI. Yeah. Because everyone will be lazy, which no trial, no study has ever shown. And these stories where there's a billionaire who started with nothing and worked really menial jobs and got his start, you know, scrubbing toilets or whatever. And now look at where he is now. And so we can do the same thing too. So we, if we accept these menial jobs that don't pay very much and, you know, work long nights, work three jobs if necessary, then one day we could be a billionaire too. Not realizing that everybody can be billionaires. It's just literally impossible. No. Just these sorts of messaging is so alluring to people because people are struggling with low wages and high inflation. And so they have these dreams of being a billionaire one day where they don't have to worry about bills and money and how they're going to take care of their families. And so this billionaire dream is very attractive and they want to defend it, even though it'll probably be out of the reach for most of the people who are defending it. And so it's tough. Like it's important, I think, to change the rhetoric we're using, but I think it's a long game too. The messaging that we're hearing now has been in the development for decades. And so I think the messaging we're using isn't going to have an overnight positive effect. I think it's going to take some time and you just people have to be in it for the long term. Right. It's interesting you, you talk about, oh, I'm not going to attack billionaires because one day I, I'll probably be a billionaire, right? Like there's this like holdout, there's this dream where I don't have to worry about the basics, you know, and the bills that pile up. And it's like, that's UBI. You could have it. 
we could have it. We we could we sh it shows that it pays for itself on so many levels, whether it's hospital uh, savings, justice, the alleviation of crime, specifically petty crime that we you know we deal with on the on everyday basis, and the mental health issues that are all you know holistically uh, you know revolving around the fact that uh, people are struggling on all these levels. That there's a scarcity issue and a poverty issue, and people think of also poverty is like you're out on the street. Poverty is you know it's rampant. It's how am I going to get past this? next bill, you know, and these are the things that hold us back and keep us in so much fear. And yet there's ways to overcome that. And there's systems that are being utilized. And, you know, UBI is coming. It's whether it's be going to be triggered by AI or the fact that the, the momentum for UBI, uh, the truth comes out. We just have to keep you know, educating and learning. And one of the books that I can, you know, say that really helped me was Utopia for Realists by Rucker Bregman. And he talks about where we're at right now and things are pretty good, you know, in the span of history. So some good context there and be thankful for what we've got, but we can do better. And his uh, chapters on UBI are incredible because they do debunk all of the things, whether it's the lazy poor trope, where did it come, uh, you know, from the Nixon era and you know, Nixon was actually going to put through a UBI and last minute this thing happened, but it was a misunderstanding. And I mean, you look throughout history and you, there's all these circumstances that if they had just gone a little differently, we'd be in a different position. That's where incrementalism gets erased and we actually can jump forward is if we on that level where we can and, and specifically provincial because that's, you know, healthcare, care, education, disaster management, resource extraction, uh, you know, the environmental protections. There's so many things that we can do to get past incrementalism, yet we are stuck without having narratives like a, a UBI, like, you know, the mental health is again like bringing it back to that we've come so far on on just understanding mental health and having the language around it we can do that for our you know economic benefit as workers as well by continuing to push narratives that are proven that are that have trials that are shown to work that pay for themselves and then some uh, and we continue to push these narratives because if we don't do it then who will do it and without a labor party in alberta for example uh, who's going to look after uh, the people in that regard? Who's going to implement the rent caps and, and caps on utilities and, you know, the things that help everyday people? Uh, I, I don't know, because when there's an opportunity, there's just such a, a, a disappointment. You know, with, with the NDP, it was such a disappointment. And at the end of the day, it, it comes back to, to our democracy and, and how important it is because, yeah, it's flawed. And yeah, the first past the post system sucks. It's almost impossible for the people to create real change, but that almost is the back door entrance. It's the Trojan horse in. And that's why I still believe I don't put up my middle fingers and say, you know, F the government. That, that's easier. And you just go on with your life. Good people, you know, people like yourself, Kim, people that, you know, want to see change. We, we need to come together. And politically, yeah, I think that it does have to happen. And, and that back door in, it can create change. And what I saw going back to fire and my work there was what I saw in, in the fire department is kind of, a, it, it correlates with what I'm talking about is there was a bit real like old boys club. You had to act a certain way and you had to kind of be like tough and hide your feelings and you know, all those things that uh, of toxic masculinity were happening on, on you know, a certain level. And some of that is team building, but some of it is absolutely toxic. And so 15 years ago, you know, we didn't talk about mental health and we didn't, you know, have language around, you know, uh, a lot of the inclusivity that we do today. Sometimes it goes too far. I'll give it that. But at the time, there was nothing. And so, you know, me doing yoga, here's how crazy it was. Me doing yoga in the fire station was like, what a queer, you know, like you had to act a certain way to be a firefighter back then. And, you know, and it was worse the generation before me. There was a lot of toxicity around that. So me doing yoga or whatever, but you do it anyway, Kim, because <laughs> it means something to you because you know it's healthy and you break those norms. And you see other people do it, whether it's a guy who sits down and just doesn't eat meat, eats an avocado. He's like, right, the whole table blows up because <laughs> it doesn't didn't happen back then. You know, like making these healthy choices, breaking through a narrative that was unhealthy for the workers, and they imposed this on themselves and refereed it to a certain degree, which was ridiculous. You just slowly chip away at it. You point out, you know what, that comment was, you know, racist, and you may, maybe you do it in a joking way where you don't, 
you know, rock and flip the boat, but you do say something and you constantly do that and other people pick up on it and the younger people come in and pick up on it and the culture has changed. Now, sometimes it goes too far, but the culture change at the station now is a way more comfortable place to be, absolutely. And people are okay with talking about intelligent things and speaking about feelings, you know, like it's a big change. Now, going back to what I'm saying, we can do that within the legislative building, within parliament, within our local city halls and things like this, is we can come in, whether it's partisan or not, right? Like on all parties, there's good people. That is for sure. That is 100%. And they want to see good things happen for their families. And there's good people. There always is. You need to see each other. You need to align with each other beyond the partisanship roles. If you know that someone is an advocate for wage earners and for the rights that will help people on a level that is a game changer, then you align with them no matter what party they're in. You, you notice, you know, you give them the signal and you can create a change within these institutions and within the halls of power similar to, this is what I feel, similar to what you can do in a fire station. And it takes time, but you can break through the partisanship. You can come together and you can create those examples. Now, there's a lot that keeps us down within the system. You see the NDP has the biggest opposition they've ever had. It's like, but it doesn't mean anything, right? It doesn't mean anything. And what are they doing with it? Nothing. Like if I was in there, I'd be slamming the table. I would, we would be making such noise around these things that are not for the benefit of the people. And yet these people, you know, they've got the large opposition and yip de do da day. We don't see anything coming from them and, or specifically creating change within the halls of power. Again, I, you know, to the people that are listening, it's like, just, you know, join, join a party, join the Greens, join the, you know, NDP, like, I want to see you in those meetings. I want to, like, there's a way to overcome where it's this rise up of good people noticing one another and then working together to overcome the narratives or the regulations that keep us apart. And as you said, partisanship is a massive, massive roadblock. And also, you know, the what I said, the poisoning of the well on good ideas is another big roadblock. But there's things that we can all agree on. There's basic things, poverty bad. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. There's things that we can agree on. When I'm knocking on doors and talking about crime, everyone gets it. It's not a secret that if you eradicate poverty, that crime rates would drop. But people maybe aren't connecting the dots right away, you know. And so again, these conversations are important. Bringing it back to to workers or to to my position within the fire service and these little incremental things that we can do to create that leap, you know, but just being quiet and taking it, that's not enough. You know, we need to definitely recognize the people that, that are pushing the movement. It goes in waves. Don't you agree, Kim? Like it's yeah. like, there's lots of strikes going on right now, but like, we didn't see this type of labor action for a while. Yeah, totally. No, I, I agree. I, I do think that it has to come from the bottom up. It has to be a grassroots movement because I think that the major parties are invested in the current system and they aren't, at least, you know, as far as yes. poverty goes, I don't think they are invested in eradicating poverty because when workers are impoverished, they are less likely to take risks that could put their jobs in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So they will be less likely to unionize. They'll be less likely to go out on a general strike. They'll be less likely to do anything that could jeopardize their jobs. And the reason why I think that means that poverty won't be addressed by the major parties is that because they are supported by the employers of those workers, right? Th those employers who you know, donate to the parties who sit on their advisory councils and their committees and govern their constituency associations and, and that sort of thing. And so I don't think it's going to come at the party level. I think it has to come at the grassroots level. And I'm not sure how that's going to happen. Are we seeing progress? Maybe the, the current labor movement, the upsurge in union support is a positive sign. Maybe that if that continues and we see an upward surge in unionization in the province and maybe in Canada as well, maybe that's something that the working class can build off of. But I think it's still too early to tell. I, I really do. But going back to your story, mm -hmm. so you mentioned about your parents. Do you have siblings as well? Yeah, I got an older brother, stepbrother, half brother, and two stepsisters. So mixed family, various ages. What are they doing for work? What 
What's their life like? Yeah, most people went into the business world in my family. I would say like my media family, you know, growing up like sort of small C conservative, right? Again, it comes down to values. Uh, my values were different than theirs in, in the regards to the need for service and for giving back. And that doesn't make me better or worse. I felt like a black sheep, it, you know, generally in society. I'm also like, I follow... Uh, a lot of the the Buddhist philosophy, uh, the four truths of Gautama Siddhartha, and uh, that's a lot of like non-attachment, right? Taking away attachment from our lives so that we can alleviate suffering, and suffering is imposed from the clinging to things in a transient world. Right. These things help, you know, drastically move away from the materialism and the golden handcuffs that are offered to people, uh, and especially people with privilege. You know, I'm the first to say that I've have a, a very supportive family and, and I'm, you know, a white male. I have a lot of privilege. And when I look back on my life, I realize, yeah, you know, I got, I got a lot of breaks that other people didn't. And again, that pushes me further to say, how can I give back? How can I be of service for the people that are suffering? Right. Yeah. Taking advantage of that privilege. Yeah. Like I'll fucking cry right here because it's, it, it, people are hurting so much. Um, it's not okay. Yeah. 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 And so again, it's what we can do. Again, not everyone has the bandwidth. And and again, within Utopia for Realists, uh, Rucker Bregman talks about the capacity and bandwidth. You know, when you're in poverty, for example, your bandwidth is diminished. And so it's, you just don't make good decisions sometimes. You get in a in the carousel of misery and you don't have the bandwidth to overcome this. I got to just eat you know, yeah. or I got to just pay this bill, I'll do whatever it takes. And then when you have a family involved, there's more pressure and people break down. Absolutely. But if you have the bandwidth, you need to be showing up, whether it's at the rallies, uh, you know, whether it's with the policy or whatever. And yes, we need people outside the building. We need general strikes. We need uh, worker solidarity, but we need people inside too. Not everyone can, can have the capacity to say, how do I get inside? Yeah. Some people need to, two, three, right? Because you need people inside and outside for a breakthrough. Yeah. There has to be a diversity of tactics. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. And so, and we need to see each other and we need to have these conversations and more podcasts like this, uh, Kim. So I love what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned, I think you said you're married. I was just wondering, you know, how did yeah. you and your spouse meet? We met uh, at her restaurant. So she owned Nourish in Edmonton. It was like one of the very first vegan sort of vegetarian restaurants there. And she created this restaurant. It's a place for awakening under the guise of a cafe. As you know, many revolutions and evolutions happen in a cafe or a small bar and where we can gather and we can talk about issues that are maybe outside the norm or demand better or demand more from you know the people that you know have all the resources and uh, are not you know allowing us to thrive and to have that bandwidth that is so critical for good decisions and health yeah i went in there and uh, and i saw her and i was like what a firecracker i'm gonna stay away from her <laughs> yeah. And then um, I was moving into the same sort of group because I was, you know, looking for something more than a pub to spend my time and, and, to, and to meet and have these important conversations. And we uh, met up again a couple months later and we hugged and that was it. We were, we were basically married at that moment. I was looking for a ring two months later and we were engaged about four months in and then I married a year later. Love it. First hug. Yeah. Yeah, really. It was, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to just kind of let your flow happen. You're evolving and people who are looking, oh, why can't I meet the right person? I, I always say I'm at the right person and it doesn't, you know, nothing works for everybody like the same way, but this is how it happened for me. I met the right person because I was trying to evolve myself and I was focusing in on the passions that mattered to me and my health. And through that, I was guided straight to the person that I needed to be with. Yeah. I think that a lot of times like people are, they're concerned about, I need to find the right person and not realizing that somebody else is saying the same thing. And you're so close to being the right person for them, but you just have to change this, this, and this about yourself. And then you'll be the right person for them. Uh, and that person yeah. may end up being the right person for you. And so a lot of times we have this, this mentality. It's like, I need something into my life. I mm. need to take mm. from the universe rather than realizing that I need to give to the universe as well. And so, yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. You're nailing it. Right. Because it was like, work on yourself. You, you will end up in the places you need to be for that meeting to happen. Hopefully. Yeah.
it's so skewed now, right? People don't even talk to people. Uh, they just on apps. I don't know. I don't know what the kids are doing. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what the kids are doing, but you know, I've been around the fire tables enough to see that it's very different. And and again, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. And and you know, going back to okay, how do you come to your truths and align with yourself so that when you meet that person, that you you can understand the connection. And that's really important because if not, exactly, you just need that one more thing or that one more thing, and you know, to attract that. Whereas you are already it and so what what matters to you deeply right if it's workers rights then you know hang out with fight back and go uh, to every protest you i'm sure you're going to meet a dazzling person so um <laughs> if it's something else then you know go with it you know if it's running then join a running club it's not really that difficult but you have to put yourself out there and that's hard for people as well yeah. especially after the after covid and and all all of the issues that we've had but but you know you can do it if anyone's listening to this still after all this time, you can do it. You can get out there. But again, it, it's like anything. If you just work on yourself, you know, you, you find that the inner uh, truth, it, it will will guide you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So we've already talked about your, a little bit about your experience being the leader of a smaller political party in Alberta. Yes, sir. I would think it's a bit of a jump to go from being a firefighter to the leader of a, a political party. And if I'm not mistaken, you had you ran the third largest number of candidates in the provincial election. We did. Maybe if you want to talk about that journey a little bit. The Alberta Worker Podcast is a proud member of the Labour Radio Podcast Network. Here's a jingle from another member of the network. Hey folks, it's Bama Athreya, your host on The Geek Podcast. You can find us on Stitcher, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And this show is now part of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. You can discover more than just us by visiting their website at laborradionetwork.org. The Labor Radio Network will help you find your favorite union podcast or radio show, besides this one, of course. And now back to the show. You're listening to the Alberta Worker Podcast. Within a two-party system, it becomes harder and harder. As you see in the States, it becomes harder. And speaking of the States, uh, Cornell West going for the, as the president uh, nominee for the Green Party. Everybody go watch that and support that. Call your friends. Uh, that's a huge game changer. And that's what we were trying to do too, is, is be a game breaker, a system changer. The thing was, you, you're watching these politicians and you're like, why aren't they talking about this, this, and this, which would actually create meaningful change, you know, rent controls and, uh, you know, working for the working class and uh, UBI, eradication of poverty, mental health as, you, as a universal right, all these things you're like, these are no brainers because they give back, they give back to everyone, you know, create a, a society, a safe supply and dealing, you know, full on with the epidemic of poison drugs. It's like, Every day, like you're watching, you know, for example, COVID, you're seeing how they're reacting to this, all the media attention, they're giving you the numbers every day. Well, what about the opioid crisis? Why aren't we seeing the numbers every day and, and, the, and the tragedy that these persons are dealing with? Why aren't we having these discussions? First and foremost, it was like, let's bring the discussion of proportional representation, of universal basic income of you know, actually fighting the opioid crisis as if it was a, a crisis, climate issues, of course. Let's talk about this and how do you do it? Well, you know, you can wait for someone else or you can try your best. <laughs> and so that's kind of where I stepped in. And, and especially as a disaster manager, I knew I had a lot to offer because we're, you know, it is a disaster that we're in. When I got in disaster management, I, you know, I worked with the Red Cross. I did, um, you know, I worked in the wildfire um, response for Fort Mac and, and flooding in, in Calgary. And, and that was kind of the, okay, I'm using my masters in this way, but you just, again, the, the, you look at why these were created. It's created because there was no proactive uh, legislation to protect these people or to create the resources. So very quickly, a disaster happens when a hazard overcomes the resiliency of a people, and then they become vulnerable, and then that is a disaster. So that's the formula that you're looking at. So how are we creating the resiliency? How can we help uh, working class people, everyday Albertans that are struggling on all these different 
fronts and, and will struggle as the climate crisis continues and that you know will create so many more issues. So yeah, so I went to the party that just had my values and the Greens aren't perfect by any means. You know, my family was, like I said, a small C conservative family and I wasn't waving the green banner and didn't have posters on the wall. But you look at what you've got and you say, okay, like how can we make this better and how can we, you know, make this a bigger boat and, and bring this to the people so that we can have these, at least start to have these discussions. So when I look at the success of this last election, we broke through the narrative of of just, you know, you saw the debate. I mean, I wish I was in the debate, but you saw the debate. It, they talked about nothing, you know, two wings, that same bird just flapping away. They were dressed the same. Both were in blue, so it made it easier for people to really hone in on the two sides of the same coin aspects. You know, oil and gas corporations were cheering because no one would be, uh, you know, for the people. All these corporations are, you know, benefiting from, you know, this two sides of the same coin, uh, two-party system that we're allowing. So breaking through that, yeah, I mean, the success of even talking about this was massive to being on media. You know, it's on tons of media, you know, sh you know shout out to all the podcasts that I was on. And it's really exciting to see people start coming together when they hear something that's authentic as well. That really pushes the movement forward. We ran 41 candidates. Uh, here's another working class issue. If your company that you're working for has a connection to the government in any way, that company comes back to you and says, I see you're running as a candidate. You need to take a month leave. You cannot be associated to this company while you're running as a candidate. And so we had five people drop out. That's massive for a small party. Wow. Because they can't afford that. Wow. We had people that were like, I'm still going to do it. And then they're like, is my position secure? They're like, no. So, so they're like, so wait, so I might not be able to come back to my position. They're like, no. And you're like, okay, well, how is that fair? And, and this is another thing. How are you going to have working class voices when you have rules like that? Well, it's like what I was talking about before about, you know, employment precarity. People aren't going to stand up if they're worried they're going to lose their jobs. Exactly. Exactly. So it's a massive issue. We lost five candidates, let alone the other five that, uh, you know, would have came in, uh, you know, especially last minute, there was a lot of people that were all of a sudden wanting to run uh, because right. they were seeing the momentum. And, and, exactly. and of course, politics isn't on everyone's mind until there's an election too, especially for working class people. It was wild. So anyways, within those conditions, uh, we still had more uh, candidates than the Alberta party and the Liberal party combined. And we ran, uh, you know, candidates, but we lost a lot of key ridings, you know, those small urban centers, like, you know, like, uh, even left bridge and around left bridge and around some of the urban centers, that's where we can really make a breakthrough because, you know, people are so tired of these of, of these two parties and it was so evident there that they were looking for something else we doubled our vote you know we're still light years away from those two parties but we came third so we came seven we went from seventh place forgotten to third place in one election cycle so that was a massive success and how did you place in individual ridings? Were you third in a lot of the ridings as well? We were, and I think it was 26 third place finishes, which we had some bronze medals to show for it, but it's a winner take all. First past the post, baby. <laughs> how many did you run in again? We ran 41. So 26 out of 41, you had third place finishes. Yes. That's awesome. I have the stats somewhere. I sent out a sort of a recap to the members. Those people that want to stay in touch, you know, go to albertagreens.ca and, you know, even just sign up for the newsletter or whatever. And we can kind of keep track of where we're going with this because we're talking about name changes. You know, we're talking about what does it look like as a labor party? I was just about to ask about that, about name changes. We're talking about name changes. We don't want to lose green completely because uh, although you know people might have problems with the federals or other provincial parties, but greens are around the world. We don't want to try and prove to the people again that we care about the environment and about the climate, and you know, so we don't want to need to start again there. We know that those are going to become more and more important. What we do need to show is that we are a bigger boat than these two issues. Is what we did in this last election, specifically in Alberta. I don't want to say far left, but I mean on vote compass it was far left from the centrist uh, stand for nothing parties. So we were there uh, standing for workers' rights, celebrating unions, thinking about how to benefit the working class people and, and everyday Albertans. It meant a lot to people. And I can, uh, you don't even know the crescendo of messages that I got that said, hey, not this time, because Smith is so bad. I'm going to vote NDP. Right. You know, next time. But next time there will be something else, right? She, she's still a party next time. Like, they won. So they're going to be in office next time. Yeah, and it'll be the same thing. We right. got to get rid of Smith. Yeah. And we were so close last time. We, we almost so won. 
We're the largest opposition ever. We're so close. We just need a few more seats. Yes, you're, yeah, exactly. And it means nothing because if you don't have at least a third party, hopefully more, you will not create more accountability. You will not create a minority government, which has some levels of accountability where parties at least have to talk to each other just a bit to get things passed. Absolutely. And then moving towards coalition government, which is, of course is the is the dream for democracy, is, is sure. proportional representation and actually having a functioning democracy, uh, which we need to demand as workers and as everyday Albertans because it serves us. It was a uphill battle. And then going, you know, you know, obviously people have a lot of preconceived notions of what green are. So it was like reintroducing them to the Alberta brand they went from uh oh i didn't know we had a, an alberta green party <laughs> to uh you know people wanting to understand more about it uh you know a lot of interviews and things like that and and even on the street i mean i was at the grocery store and people someone didn't know who i was but i said hey what do you know about the the green party of alberta and you know, well i don't know who leads them but i know that they did pretty good and and i know that and i said well what do they stand for the environment and i'm like okay well we still got a lot of work to do here right yeah poverty was the main thing we were running on uh, poverty i would say and, and democracy because when you get people out of poverty they start caring a bit more about the trees and the bees and the birds yeah. uh, you know <laughs> and then when you have a functioning democracy then everyone works together you know to a certain extent and more values are implemented at the table and there's more accountability. So those were the start. But, you know, pushing, you know, climate agendas and things like that, you know, it was in our platform. But, you know, people know we're for that. But what else do they need to do? So we have a lot of work to do. But coming from seventh to third is tremendous. You know, other than the NDP, we were the only party that raised their popular vote. And that's how big the vacuum was. Everyone else dropped some like big rocks. Right. You know, we're in, a, in a, an exciting position. Uh, we're looking at co-leadership models as we've done around the world. We're seeing who wants to step up to the plate. Uh, you know, nothing is off the table uh, regarding how we maneuver to create a bigger boat in regards to more representation without selling out. And selling out doesn't work. You look at the NDP. Do you sell out to the right, become neoliberalist? You know, you, the people don't know what you stand for anymore. And it's true. You just stand yeah. for re-election. That's not a thing. Well, and now they've lost two elections in a row. Yeah, exactly. And Notley needs to go. Notley, pack your bags. And I would be happy to work with, you know, an NDP party that, you know, went back to the table on democracy, uh, went back to the table on UBI, and went back to the table with their with their leadership. And, you know, kick out the lobbyists uh, that are working and shilling for oil and gas. Kick out the lobbyists that are steering you in, in a way that you're, you're going to, you know, constantly compromise your value system. So I don't really care where you are on, on, you know, in the left and right spectrum. Like you said, it's like too much left and right. What do left people do? What do we put ourselves in a box? Like, who gives a shit? Stand for your values. Stand strong for your values that you know are right and you know are in the benefit of the people. And let other people decide if you're left or right. It doesn't even matter, right? It, what matters is, is that you are speaking to your values and that people can either get on the bus or get off the bus. And not everyone's gonna get on the bus and that's democracy, more of that, right? You don't have to vilify people if they're not on the bus. Right. It's just terrible what it's come to. And, the, yeah. and there's ways out, but you know people have to get involved and, and people need to, to, like we said in our motto, demand better. It's also the motto of a, of a labor movement, I believe, is to demand better. So it's funny because we, we came, came up with that you know, on our own and then we realized that a lot of people were using it. And I think that it's good because it's a rallying cry. And, uh, you know, I even see some, you know, NDPers, you know, say that in their social media or whatever. And it's like, I'm, I'm watching you guys. There's good people. I see you guys, you know, and that's, we have to keep doing that. You know, we have to keep seeing each other and, and, and putting out the sign. And I don't want to be a green team, I'm not waving the flag here. I want to see good people that stand for the values and, and some of the values I won't agree on and some of the values I will agree on, but if you don't stand for anything and you're just part of a team. Oh my gosh, we got a long way to go. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so you're at where you are now. We've come to the end of your here life story. Nice. This is That's it. A... Yeah. <laughs> uh, I also like snowboarding and surfing. Nice. I play baseball. You know, I love sports. Uh, you know, we're nailing it because again, it's like at the end of the day, we have to look back on our lives and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we've made life better for some people. And I think that you know, the more we can do our part, and that's the power of people, you know, we have the, the power to, to all do our part to make things better. And then when that noise rises, and we can really agree on some of the fundamentals, like 
poverty does not need to exist, that we have the resources and the means, we can move forward. And we can create that big change that isn't incremental. It's brutal the way they've set us up to fight each other. We have to overcome that. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, so a question I always ask each of my guests is, how has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker? And that could be everything from gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, disability, age, economic class, whatever it happens to be. If you have marginalization, how has your interaction of those marginalizations ever influenced your experiences as a worker? Mm -hmm. I was always told, look, Jordan, you keep moving. You're never going to become a firefighter. Uh, you're too small. You're not the, really the type. You don't really look like one. Like, where's your mustache? You know, like, there's a look. Uh, and apparently I didn't fit that look and and that was all BS. And so uh, how I overcame was it's fuel, you know, to work harder, to, to zero in and everyone knows their capability. Yeah, there's some people maybe aren't suited for that job, but deep down I knew I was for various reasons. One of them being that I went and did training and did really well, but like, you know, I did a co-op in high school and I did have opportunities. So uh, I haven't been overly marginalized uh, other than the fact that I was told constantly. And also I was told, look, you're a white male. We're not looking, I literally at the door, we're not looking for you guys anymore. We have enough of you guys. That was interesting, but you just keep going, right? You're like, okay, well, that was in BC. And I was like, okay, I'm going to keep moving. And maybe that's that's very real for them. Uh, also, I was younger. So I, at first I was obviously taken aback. Sure. But within the, the culture, you know, if you don't specifically fit in at first too, you have to be strategic about that. You know, I'm queer. That's not advertised in the fire department and man at first would they be uncomfortable with me. So I certainly didn't uh, talk about that. And even my spirituality and things like that, everyone knew I was a little different. But, you know, again, at the end of the day, I got in there, I did the job, I fought the fire, I proved myself. We had each other's backs. Uh, and you build that rapport. That was my experience was you build that teamwork. And, you know, every year I got a little bit more myself. You have to build a track record that when the shit hits the fan, you're going to rise, you know, rise up to that occasion and you're not going to panic. And there's been, you know, moments where, you know, guys were, you know, not and no hit on them, but, you know, they, they froze or they, you know, they were throwing up because it was so bad and, and I was able to go in. Yeah, maybe I had to do therapy after, right? But like, we all have our job to do in those services where we can rise and we notice that from each other. And then we know that, okay, this person, you know, is not going to leave me hanging. It's all about being a team. Here's the funny thing, Kim. It's like, oh yeah, Jordan, you're skinny. Can you crawl down the space and try and make contact? <laughs> so yeah, so I'm the guy crawling through the rubble or the back of the car to, you know, untach a seatbelt and so it's like yeah you need one of those guys right but then yeah. you also need maybe you know the big person to you know pull that last thing out or break down the door when you're gassed out i have no idea so the diversity is critical uh, to an extent everyone still has to do the job everyone has to pick up a certain amount of weight and all that crap and that's all still very important but the diversity within a, a diverse service is critical so yeah i mean it's it's been an, an interesting journey to become more and more myself and Here's the breakout, like into politics, you're like, people are going to talk about this, you know, but everyone's going to talk about it. And some people aren't going to like you. And some people are going to call you a tree hugger or whatever. People aren't going to like you if you speak to your values because values might not align or there's a misconception or they, there's some awareness that, you know, needs to happen. I have a lot of compassion for that. But if we don't, we just sit in the echo chambers, we don't get anywhere and it's, it's, toxic for your own spiritual growth and your own intellectual growth. So that's been a massive movement for, you know, just myself is going through that and then going into politics. Now it's like, I also you know, do a lot of music and I've performed and, you know, some people, they like what I'm doing. And as I got more into my own style, you saw people getting closer and some people being like, I ain't into that walk, turn and walk away. But that's important. You need to really step into that. And politically, that was, I mean, I mean, people were like, dude, I hope you die. I hope you vomit on your, like, you know, I was like, oh my God, it's like vile, but you're like, that's okay. Because you know, when you put yourself out there, you're going to get that. That is shocking at first. And you need to go through increments of whatever that is. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if people like me or not, you know, it, I'm pretty clear on what I think is, is right and wrong and, and my value system. And I think that that's what leadership 
uh, it needs to be because you're not going to be perfect. You're going to mess up or you're going to say something that could be misconstrued or, or, you know, misinterpreted and that's okay. And when it happens, you either apologize, you try to clarify. And if people turn your back and walk away from you, then it means that they, they never cared to know what you're about. And, and that's okay too, because they'll never be your fan or vote or your friend, any of that, right? They have a certain mindset and that's okay. And people in the fire department that I maybe don't see eye to eye with, you can still go and do the job. You still go fight fire and have each other's backs. Cause at the end of the day, you both care deeply about your families and you both want to do well and help other people. And, and I love that. I love it. So, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're connected. Like we're all in the same boat, as you said, and, and we're all in this together, whether we like it or not. I think that, you know, the more we can get to back to the basics and speak and disagree and have compassion for one another. And that's critical too. a lot of compassion now for people that are mad at me for uh, trivial reasons, speaking out on, you know, something and, and someone backlashes at me. And I have a lot of compassion. And then I know that a lot of people have fear in their lives. And a lot of that fear is, is constructed in, in nefarious ways that, that don't help uh, working class people and average people come together and demand more or speak out on things as we've talked about. So that's the critical thing is have compassion for people. And, you know, even some of the people that you think are just vile and the worst, I still have compassion for them. You know, at the end of the day, I'm not, I wouldn't fight them in a bar. <laughs> You're on Twitter, just chill out a little bit, okay? <laughs> yeah, and that's something I've been trying to work on as well the last, I don't know, two or three years or whatever, is just trying to be, you know, less combative, try to you know be more mindful and present and trying to recognize that people are more complex than their online personas. They might have trauma they're dealing with. They might have uh, experiences that have shaped their lives. We just never know, right? And so I personally believe that everybody has inherent value. And so we need to respect that value and, you know, build up that value, enrich that value. And so, yeah, I think there's, I think it's important for us to be able to show compassion to everyone. Any final thoughts for our listeners? Although it seems like you just gave some final thoughts. Yeah, I think that that's a good way to end it. You know, even like, think about it that, by the way, share this episode and give Kim some support and what he's doing is so critical and there's not enough of it. So I, I you know, I hope that people will share, you know, all his, his, his work that he's doing. Uh, I, again, I'm a big fan of, of the work that he's doing. And my, my final thought is, you know, if you're listening in the car and, you know, that person cuts you off in front of you, like, like leaving it on this note is that you don't know what kind of day that person's having. And the things that are going on in their lives. And, you know, I think we've all been there where we're driving or we're, you know, in our lane, and we're going through something and maybe we're not paying attention. That is life. And being compassionate is the start. And but pointing out when people are in the wrong is fine as well. But it doesn't have to be your identity and it doesn't have to be their identity. That's critical. More people that are united, talking, sharing our resources, helping one another out. This is the way forward. We can we can do better. But again, we need to keep that conversation going uh, and we need to demand better on certain levels. And so be involved. And I hope that people will, you know, uh, they can follow on Twitter. I've I think I changed my handle, Jordan Wilkie GPA, you know, and we're on Facebook and stuff like that. You can, we're looking for, you know, positions in the party. If you are super aligned, you want to be a co-leader of a political party, show me what you got. You know, it's an opportunity that was given to me and, and I don't own it. Uh, we are stewards and, you know, it, none of this is our, is, is again, is our property. You know, uh, it's it's about stewardship and it's about doing what we can with the bandwidth that we have. And so, again, if I can help other people, I'll do it. And if you guys have the bandwidth to get involved, jump on. Let's let's uh, let's have that conversation and continue this. Yeah, totally. Yeah, the whales and the lions and the bears and the birds aren't going to save the world from climate change. No, they're not. It's going to have to be us. So it has to be everyday people. It has yeah. to, and it, it, can't, it can't be the billionaires and it can't be the politicians that are there for, you know, in establishment parties uh, that are working for elites. It's just not going to happen. So and this is why I became the leader. If it's not me, then who? Yeah. Maybe you don't have to be a leader uh, of a political party, which is a bit of a step, but just in your life, if not you, then who's it going to be? Sure. 
that's the opportunity and and where it leads is uh, magical and again thanks for having me on today yeah you betcha we'll make sure to include all that information in the podcast description for people who want to follow you and the green party of alberta if people are interested in following the alberta worker you can find us on social media we're on facebook twitter and linkedin you can also go to our website at albertaworker.ca and when you're there you can sign up for our newsletter we have daily weekly and monthly subscriptions please rate our podcast and leave a review and share it with your friends if you want to support the alberta worker you can visit us at albertaworker.ca slash support the alberta worker and this podcast are made possible because of the generous donations of listeners like you if you want to be a guest on the alberta worker just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca or send me a dm on social media thanks very much jordan for joining us today it was a great conversation thanks also to all of our listeners for joining in and as always solidarity Thank you.